This is the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. All right, I'm going to zap her again. Charge up the paddles. Come on, let's go, let's go. Sorry, Doctor. Hold the compressions. Clear. Straight line. Good evening and welcome to Rock and Roll Autopsy. We are the forensic files on your radio dial. My name is Scott, and have we got a great show for you tonight? No, we don't. Damn it. The phone is ran again. It's the request line. All right, let's pick it up. WRNRA, East of the Rockies. Hey, Breather, what's going on, man? You think heavy metal is cheesy? adolescent, unlistenable tripe, and wish it would die a horrible, violent, gory death? You're crazy. You can't kill metal. What do you mean if you can't kill metal, you'll settle for killing shitty rock and roll podcast? Listen, you called the request line. Is there a song you'd like us to perform an autopsy on? I said... <laughs> the metal? By Tenacious D, you got it. All right, buckle up, gang. The subject of our rock and roll autopsy tonight will be The Metal by semi-serious comedy rockers Tenacious D. We'll get the show started after these very important messages from our sponsors. What's up, music nerds? Are you tired of wading through a sea of mediocre music, desperately seeking to find a glimmer of greatness? You're in luck. My name is Mark, and I am the host of the podcast, Songs That Don't Suck. Each week, I scour the depths of new music playlists to unearth hidden gems that defy the trends and deliver pure sonic bliss. No matter the genre, if it doesn't suck, it's on my radar. So find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. And as always, keep searching for and listening to Songs That Don't Suck. Breaking news! What is this garbage you're watching? I want to watch the news. This is the news. All right, gang, we've got our intrepid rock and roll beat reporter on the line, Rico Ganu. No, How the hell are you? I am fucking warm and fuzzy in the bee's knees and unicorns and fucking sprinkles man how about you uh yeah dude um puppy dogs unicorns hot fudge sundays the whole nine yards man what's your favorite sunday topping did we go over this you ain't fat you ain't fat you ain't fat you ain't nothing i'm not fat I'm big boned. Oh, for God's sake. Um, I don't, you know what? Already with the food diversion. Um, surprise, surprise. I don't have a favorite Sunday topping. It's something I've never given any thought to ever. That's okay. Um, that means you're open to anything. Um, you? Let's get, uh, 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 I don't have a preference. So <laughs> I like them all. I like them all. Um, I, any kind of anything with sugar in it is good for me. Um, let's get red. Let's get to it. What do you say? Let's do it, man. All right. So I, I have to ask you about this real quick. Um, so uh, without getting into too much detail, my son has special needs. He needs staff 24 hours a day and I can't be there all the time. So one of our staff is a 27 year old. Ethnicity is not an issue here, but he's non white. OK, um, so he walks in the other day. And uh, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because it, like, I was shocked and surprised. He walked in with a T-shirt, and it was a Pixies T-shirt. It had Pixies in black letters, and I, I texted you a picture. It's got the big mushroom on it. And I, I've, like, out loud, I said, 
holy shit, that's a Pixies t-shirt. Do you, do you, and I, I, I knew he didn't know who the Pixies were. I said, do you know who the Pixies are? Do you know that they're a band? He's like, oh, no, I, I had no idea. He's like, he said, I had no idea that it was a band or anything. I said, yeah, and I explained to them that, you know, who they are and that Nirvana almost kind of ripped them off a little bit in their sound and yada, yada, yada. We all know the story. But is this, I think you had mentioned this before, that this is a thing now where, where, people that are younger than us are buying these shirts and they don't really care what's on the front it's just kind of like what are they going for like what do what does he go, what is he going for when he buys a pixies t-shirt and doesn't know who the pixies are you're asking me middle-aged most uncool human being alive what the thoughts of of young people um yeah yeah but you're a marketing dude so you know what the public wants <laughs> no i don't <laughs> <laughs> no it's well i can tell you what i see and that's when i'm if i'm in walmart i see a ton of rock t-shirts in the men's and women's department on the rack if I'm flipping through Instagram, I see influencers and celebrities and hip hop artists who I know aren't listening to Slayer wearing Slayer t-shirts. We're both Cleveland Browns fans and our backup quarterback wore a Slayer t-shirt to the podium last year for a presser. So I see that. And when I look at my daughter's yearbooks at the end of the year and my daughters are, I have one that's a teenager and one that's younger, I see kids in rock t-shirts rolling stones acdc def leopard a lot of nirvana motley crew i see it when i drop my youngest daughter off at school in the morning i see rock t-shirts filing into the building but none of these people that i name the influencers the hip-hop artists the football players the kids in junior high none of them are listening to these bands none of them it's just fashion that's all it is it's just fashion they don't know who the bands are. Oh, that because I was going to ask that. Do you, do you think there's any chance, like some of the kids that your uh, your girls go to school with that are wearing these shirts, is there any chance that their parents are trying to like carry the torch? No, because their parents are all younger than me and don't listen to that music either. You know, oh. I mean, we're talking. I mean, I'm an old dad for as young as my kids are. So there's their parents didn't come up on freaking Led Zeppelin for Christ's sake. They, you know, they're, they came up on the, what the digital underground and the Humpty hump, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's just as irrelevant to their parents, you know, what these songs are. So it's just fashion. That's all it Got is. It. Kids Got don't, it. they it. don't listen to the music. They don't even, some of them don't even know it's just fashion. All right. Well, enough about that. I was just, it was just kind of freaked me out. I was completely and totally not expecting him to wear that shirt. Um, anyways, moving along. So an update uh, before we get to this cool little, I got another game for you. Um, but before we get to that, um, uh, a, another Getty and Alex update, Scott, you know, in the past we had, They've been kind of putting the feelers out on maybe getting the guys back together and, you know, that kind of jazz. Well, um, I, I think this article is kind of like a don't expect anything. And if we're able to do something, it'll be a pleasant surprise. The point of this article is, is they've been jamming. Like they get together like once a week or whenever Getty's not doing an interview or something. And they get together once a week and they go down in Alex's basement and they start playing some old songs. And I think one of them said, they sound like a really bad rush cover band right now. <laughs> is what they sound like and but but alex essentially the point of the article is alex is telling everybody hey listen man we just get together quote fingers we just get together once a week and jam and my fingers are really slow and they don't do what they used to and we're probably not gonna get together we're just jamming and having some fun in other words we're kicking the can around a little bit and it's not looking good right now but we'll see what happens and if we could probably throw something together we might do you read that too out of that or is each are they trying to just tamper expectations or are they really just fucking around and have no intention of getting together anymore 
Uh, well, I don't know for sure, but I can say this. Remember last week we talked about Gene Simmons on American Idol? Yes. And we were like, hey, there's an age-appropriate role for Gene to play in the music business. And I think maybe Alex is like, you know what? We were kicking around the idea of playing, but we sound like a bad Rush cover band and my fingers don't work anymore. So maybe it should just stay in the garage. So maybe this is just that moment of age catches up to all of us. And at some point it's okay just to revert back to being a garage band and play with your friend for kicks and giggles, no harm, no foul, no need to share it with the world. You know, it's okay just to have a few beers with a buddy and butcher some rush songs. That's perfectly fine. People do it in garages all across America. There are middle me middle aged men in their garage trying to recapture some youth butchering limelight even as we speak rico uh, and that's the way i read it and what i think is kind of cool about this is their whole scenario as friends and as musicians musicians has come full circle back to where it started in toronto just a couple of buddies fucking up some songs in somebody's basement just having some fun getting laughing a little bit right so this is the perfect bookend for these guys' friendship and career is to end it how they started it in somebody's basement screwing around with some songs right i think it's a perfect way to end the career if you ask me rico think about this podcast you and i have been friends <laughs> since we were teenagers we're now a thousand years old right yeah right but if we didn't do this podcast let's be honest if we right. didn't do this podcast, we'd probably talk once every six months, maybe once a year, right? You're you are you're right. You're probably right. You're but definitely right. Because <laughs> not, of the not, podcast, not for, right? Not for lack of want, right? Well, it's just that life gets all yeah. up in your face and fucks up all your friendships. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and so. And That's so there's true. nothing wrong with we do a stupid podcast, you know, two people listen. So what it, it we <laughs> connect once a week because of it. Right. And yeah. that's great. And so, yep. if, if you know, if only two people hear this new version of Rush and those two people happen to be the two guys playing it, but it keeps them connected because I don't think there's any every it's it's no secret that everybody knows that Getty and Alex are like really close friends. Right. Yeah. But yep. if they weren't doing this, maybe they wouldn't be seeing one another. So I, I can just be happy for them knowing that they're keeping their friendship alive as they march on into elderliness. Yeah, you know, and I kind of got that some of the stuff he was talking about about it, more than once in more than one article and more than one interview he has gone out of his way to mention how busy Getty is and how and how many things he's doing right now. So I think I think Al just wants to hang out and and Getty is bit and Getty's doing Getty is not ready to call it up, you know, hang it up yet and he's doing stuff and Al just wants to hang in his basement and drink a beer and play some songs, you know, and he's waiting for his bud to stop you know, to stop moving around so much, I guess. Is what I is what I took it. Anyway. But you, you know what would be cool though is if if Alex's fingers are a little cold and he admits it and he's self aware enough to say, you know what, I'm not at the standard I was and the fans deserve better. So I'll step back yeah. and just be a garage player. But if Getty still has it on the base, I don't see any reason why he can't do his own project or even join another band, you know, so what, you know what I mean? Just why can't he still play either in a band or in a new project in an existing band? He could join, he could literally join a band. Wouldn't that be crazy if like, uh if there was a vacancy in dream theater and getty lee just joined you know just like jason newstead joined voivod for a while it'd just be crazy right holy shit if he even joined if he joined voivod for a while because they're canadian too right yep I, I would you know and i have gotten i mean there I, there's been no indication that he is slowing down chops wise i mean for for from all indications there there's been no word that his hands are getting tight and which tells me that he can still play like he always has and some people just last longer than others it just happens you know what i mean yep. and if he wanted to do it, i am i'm totally with you if he wanted to do something different play some music to go out that would be amazing i would i would try to go out of my way to watch or listen i think that would be cool
What if he joined a band like Weather Report or something and just did oh some God. crazy Jocko shit? I mean, how that'd be so great to hear, you know? Oh my, that would be phenomenal, man. The Getty uh, paying tribute to Jocko by playing Jocko. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? I would probably pay triple digits if I had to to see that. Or remember the G was it the G four tour where they would take like Steve Vai and Ingve and fucking Joe Satriani would go out and tour together. What if like Flea and Getty and whatever oh Les my Claypool God. and Victor Wooten and and just get a <laughs> bunch of fucking base all stars together and <laughs> oh my God that would be awesome. Maybe the we should like put that together ever. for them. Oh my God that would be great. Oh anyway I I would love to see that happen. Okay. Uh, we have, we do have some time, so I'm going to give you the choice. We've so Loudwire has put together two lists. Okay, one list is uh, bands' best album according to them, and bands' worst album according to them. We probably only have time for one, and we can save the other one for another time. So you choose which one you want to do uh let's do i'll tell you what man let's can we do it half this week and half next week and kind of tease the listeners and yes and how do you want to approach it do you want to just go through the list or you just want to highlight favorites what do you want to do I, i'm gonna highlight because like some of them i i know that i'm not gonna know them and i'm guessing you're probably not either so i was just gonna go and like cherry pick the obvious ones cherry pick the best ones right now Okay, so uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna cherry pick the best album, and the first one is what do you think they say Anthrax's best album is? Well, I did look at the list. So, oh, okay. Yeah, oh, I looked okay. at you get you get the little notes, and so I took a look. But oh, okay, I, it's gotcha, among gotcha. the living, right? Yeah. So okay. So since you looked at the list, we'll go cherry pick the obvious ones, and you tell me if you think they're right. Cool. Okay, so Among the Living is Anthrax's best album. According to Loudwire, are they right or wrong? They are right with Sound of White Noise having a very close second place. Nice, nice. All right, let's see. Black Dahlia. Okay, here we go. They say Black Sabbath's best album is Paranoid. Right or wrong? Objectively right, but not my favorite Sabbath album. What's your favorite Sabbath album? I like Sabotage the best. Believe it or not, I like the Dio stuff. I like all the Ozzy records, but it, it's Paranoid's tough because it's so played out, man. But objectively, nice. if you were to look at it, it's a sober pick. I can't, I can't bag on them for that. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it's like an obvious choice, right? It's chalk. All right. Um, they say that Dio's best album is Holy Diver, right or wrong? It's either that or Last in Line. I could, I could do Holy Diver. Yep. Now, I could probably comment on this one. They say that their Dream Theater's best album is Images and Words. It's really good. There's other really great ones. Um, that one is the easy pick, kind of like Paranoid for Black Sabbath. It's the fish in the barrel pick. I don't agree with that one. I would probably go like Scenes from a Memory or uh, Awake is my favorite one, the one after this one. Uh, so this would this is a great album, cherry pick though. That's an obvious choice. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Emperor Gojira. Do you know any Gojira? I don't. Nope. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, they say Iron Maiden's best album is Number of the Beast. Ooh, that's tough, man. I think Number of the Beast has some weak tracks. Um, so Gangland and Vader's comes to mind. I mean, decent Maiden tunes, but kind of weak. Believe it or not, man, I'm going to come out on a super contrarian choice here. I'm going to say that's not Iron Maiden's best album, but and I love Iron Maiden, but I'm going to say they've got something in common with Kiss here, and that's they don't have a flawless record even their best records have a couple dud mm. tracks on it interesting that's an interesting take like, like peace that. of mind has sun and steel and quest for fire is just cheesy power slave has the duelist there's a couple tracks in the middle of that that just are the middle of that record lost for words that just are lame so they don't have just like kiss kiss has some great records but they don't have a top to bottom 
all killer no filler album and so for maiden's best man i would struggle i might even be really pissy and go with like a paul diano record and say like killers might be their best one can i really put you on the spot if yeah. which which two iron maiden albums if they had a baby would produce the perfect album oh wow well the run they had a really this might good... be like a re this is like a reanimator question kind of yeah kind of i mean maiden had an incredible run i mean really their records from their debut all the way up to seventh son are pretty fucking strong but all of them have a week a week to cut or two on it um oh gosh i love somewhere in time i love power slave i love the paul diano records some hybrid of those you could squeeze a great record out of i think nice i like that uh they say that judas priest's best album is screaming for vengeance 1982 are they right or wrong they're dead wrong you gotta <laughs> you gotta go that's you're into the 80s it's a great record but it's fm radio rock it's yeah. total priest has like some stuff in the 70s that's super experimental super forward thinking they're literally defining the genre of heavy metal at one point i mean you take stain class and uh, fucking sad wings of destiny and and british steel there's some great great albums in there in the 70s man i guess british steel is 1980 but i would go into the 70s for priest get out of the 80s find it in there <laughs> uh they say this album by megadeth is one that i actually go to frequently not frequently but occasionally which is saying something for me uh they say rust and peace is their best album objectively yes it's it's a it is what what iron maiden didn't achieve it's that perfect all killer no filler every track is excellent album top yeah. to bottom um my my preference for megadeth is i like peace cells better but i totally get why they picked that one it's yep. it's arguably one of the best metal albums ever made period like above all metal albums you can make an argument for it being like the best metal album ever so yep yep uh they say metallica's best album is master of puppets that's correct okay all right so mo they say motorhead's best album is ace of spades that is probably correct but motorhead never really put out a bad album and the line between what defines a great motorhead album and a less than great motorhead album is really really thin it's like fishing <laughs> wire <laughs> uh they say Oh, man, I can't wait to hear your opinion on this one. They say Ozzy Osbourne's best album is B Blizzard of Oz 1980. Uh, objectively, yeah, I could see that being the obvious one, especially for new people to heavy metal. Um, it's got Randy Rhodes on it, and he's like writing classical, neoclassical heavy metal guitar. He's like, he's like doing new stuff. We talked about it before. Blackmore was doing it previously, but he's, yep. he's making it mainstream, you know, and it's those, it's, it's Blizzard or Diary. I like Diary better, but if someone said Blizzard, sure. Yep. A couple more. Uh, they say Pantera's best one is Vulgar Display of Power. Agree okay agree yeah I, I like that one too uh rain and blood is slayer's best album agree oh, or disagree totally agree yeah okay good 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 uh all right uh last one uh even though there's other ones but that's okay what's this one uh typo negative nah who cares about them uh they say that system of a down's best album is toxicity probably but i like the um i love the uh the the double album they did yeah. mesmerize hypnotize better See, but toxicity i do good. too yeah toxicity is fine i like the double the back to back too those that's my those are sweet I, I agree with you all right so we'll save the rest for next time but for now do you want to take a little break before we get back to it i need a break man you wore me out dude I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you think that much. So, all right. So, when we get back from our little from our little siesta, we're going to talk about the D. So, stick around. We'll be right back. Looking for a good rock and roll book? Do you watch a ton of rock and roll documentaries like I do? Well, that's why I started the Rock Talk Studio podcast. To be the place to go for previews, reviews, and recommendations of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Every first Tuesday of the month, the Rock Talk Studio gets you caught up on all the latest and points out where to go for the good stuff. 
Give me 20 minutes and I'll get you caught up on the world of rock and roll books, docs, and movies from every possible angle and leave you with a no doubt decision on where to spend your time and money. Fan or just casual fan, or maybe you're on the fence and just looking for something new to check out. Either way, I got you covered. Recently on the show, I've talked about books and documentaries from everyone and everything from David Bowie, Randy Rhodes, and the Allman Brothers, to the Abbey Road Studios, Cheap Trick, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Little Richard, and more. Join me, Big Rick, every Tuesday of the month as I host the Rock Talk Studio podcast, the ultimate review of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Our Mind on Music is a podcast that covers all things music. We cover all genres, and we welcome all perspectives, from musicians, producers, and content creators, to music enthusiasts. We have discussions, interviews, opinions, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us every week, Our Mind on Music, on YouTube and all streaming platforms. We are gathered here to remember rock and roll. Rock was born, the rambunctious son of country, western, and blues. In the year of our Lord, 1955, on this day, the birth of rock and roll, gifted under the world a gyrating pelvis, a throbbing beat, and a pulsating rhythm, a sound so infectious and rollicking that it would endow previously scrupulous young minds with identity individualism and purpose, thus setting forth a multi-generational pursuit of all that is loud, debaucherous, and unholy. But, sadly, like all earthly endeavors, rock too must perish. Oh, we mourn the loss of rock and roll with its ridiculously old standard bearers still on tour and charging ungodly amounts of mad jack to witness their long past the sell by date asses on stage and with its chauvinism, misogyny and whiteness no longer aligning with modern sensibilities and with its aging, fist shaking fan base kicking every would-be rocker off their proverbial lawn, rock has indeed passed into the celestial void. May rock rest in peace in eternal cacophonous slumber. Amen. Thank you for that, Scott. You are listening to the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. The Autopsy Report. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Anybody, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages from all over the Milky Way, you are immensely tolerant for sticking around this long and listening to us. And we are uh, eternally grateful. So do us a favor, word of mouth, go find somebody that hasn't listened to us. I think they would like it if they gave it a shot. So do us a solid. And we will continue to work our asses off here in the lab for you. So, Scott... The D, man, Tenacious D. We're going to talk about the metal from The Pick of Destiny, 2006. This is a uh, Cage and JB joint, man. Uh, Really nothing else needs to be said. It's the fucking metal. Did it kill rock? I don't know, dude. That's why we're doing this. I can't wait to talk about this one. I mean, listen, Rico, we got to find out, right? If the metal by Tenacious D killed rock and roll, Dude, I got to tell you, <laughs> you ever watch, like, you ever see, like, sometimes when you're thumbing through Instagram and you see other podcasters and they have, like, these dope studios and they're all, like, sitting at a table and they've got, like, some cool branding on the wall behind them and everything looks, like, really modern. I'm so fucking uncomfortable doing this podcast. Not doing the podcast i mean just my arrangement i'm like sitting at my wife's desk i'm all cramped in she's got shit piled everywhere this chair is uncomfortable as hell dude it's like it's it's just like this the pressure it's putting on my ass cheeks and the back of my thigh i'm still having issues with my ball sack it's like resting uncomfortably on my thigh sandwiched between my thigh and the and the uh, chair 
So I'm just uncomfortable and I got to muscle through this podcast about Tenacious D and I'm probably going to make shifty noises in the chair because I'm, I'm, I'm changing the way I'm sitting because I'm really uncomfortable. Dude, I've seen, obviously, many times I've seen your setup. I've seen the little teeny sardine can that you operate in right now and, and the, the, the equivalent to like a cement block that you're sitting on right now. So you, you, you clearly, I know how, how uncomfortable you are right now. Um, but, uh, once we, you know, once we evolve to our palatial studios, um, all that's going to change, but right now we're both suffering so that we can do this for everybody else because they can't and shouldn't. Well, my less than ideal recording studio situation can't kill the metal. Let me tell you, because <laughs> I'm not going to let it hold me back. Ass cheeks be damned. Ball sack that seems to be maybe as I'm getting older, my balls are just like hanging lower and lower. That's a thing. I think when you get older, your ball sack gets droopier. Oh, God. Is that is that what's happening? Okay, quick digression. When I was a kid, there was a guy in our neighborhood who was an old man, retired, sweet old dude. So this is going to sound vaguely pedo, but it's really not. Um, he would repair, you know, when in the 80s growing up, if you were a Gen X or growing up in the 80s, your, your number one mode of transportation was a fucking BMX bike, right? Hell yeah. Well, this guy would fix our bikes. And so anytime we had like a, he'd always sit on his front porch, listening to the Cleveland Indians on his radio. And then we would come peeling out into his yard and be like, Hey, I'm going to change the name for a podcast. Uh, you know, but the names, uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. And we'd say, Hey, Mr. X, man, my chain keeps popping. Would you take a look at it? And he'd be like, sure. Bring it over to the shed. And we'd bring it over to the shed and he'd flip the bike upside down. He'd swing his shed doors open. And then he had all these tools in there and he had the, the coffee cans full of loose nuts and shit and the WD 40, the whole nine yards, typical old guy stuff. And then he'd fix our bikes and he'd be like, all right, kids have fun. Be on your way. Here's where the bad part comes in. In the summer, and this is biking weather in Ohio, oh. so it's in the summer, he would always have on, remember those shorts we used to wear back in the 80s? They were kind of short, and then they'd have that little stripe on the side, and yes. like they'd have like, the, you're covering your face because you know what I'm about to say. I know what's, I know what's coming. I know it's coming. <laughs> and they'd yeah. have the, the piping of the stripe around the thigh and then up yeah. the side. Yeah. He would sit there, not sit there, he would crouch down to work on our bikes, like kind of <laughs> squatted. And his ball sack would slide out the side <laughs> of his shorts and it would be touching the ground while he worked on her. <laughs> is, this dude, is this guy not wearing any underwear? No, I think I don't know what he had. I don't know whether he was rocking. Maybe he had boxers on. I don't know what he was rocking, but yeah, but the only be... thing you could wear with those kind of shorts are grippers, dude. Back in back then, boxers back when we were like in single digits riding bikes and shit boxers like wasn't really a thing anymore i don't think i think the general consensus was that everybody was wearing grippers because you had the shorty shorts and that was the only thing you could get away with so if that dude's sack was hanging out dude he was literally rocking those shorts with no with going commando underneath it's not a good look man <laughs> yeah, so was, my memories as a kid is Mr. X would have her bikes flipped upside down. He'd have his socket set sprawled out on the pavement and he'd squat down and then it would just, it would just fall out. Like it was fucking New Year's <laughs> Eve in Times Square. It would just fall out and hit the ground. It was so stupid. And it would just, it would just lay there. It's like, did he, how did, well, what happened? <laughs> Did, did he did he pick it up and tuck it back in or did he just wait till he was done and just let it sit there it was like a oh my gosh yeah dude it was like a uh like the ref threw a penalty flag he had to pick it up and then... <laughs> oh my gosh i can't anyway. imagine being there in person like like I'm affected by that. And I wasn't even there. We all just dealt with it. We were happy. He got us back on the road again. It was all good. It was free service. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I'm going to have anyway, tonight. 
Did the metal kill rock and roll? That is the question before us. And how, you might wonder, dear listener, do we figure this out? Well, we use proprietary science that consists of five categories. They are gratuitous boomerism, excessive misogyny, wanton whiteness, malignant machismo, and culture vulturism. Rico, the band is Tenacious D, the track the metal the album the pick of destiny the category gratuitous boomerism what say you um yeah white guy all right i don't know how else to say this so i'm just gonna say it and if i get slammed for it then oh well i guess that's what happens but white dudes doing comedy is is a boomer thing um white 50 year old guys doing comedy is boomer white 50 year old guys doing comedy songs is boomer even though everything that tenacious d has done is immensely great and they are ridiculously talented it's not about my opinion I hate to do that, but that shit is old, man. Like the only relevant, I, I, I don't want to say that people that are younger than probably 30 or 35 only know Jack Black from the movies that the recent movies that he's in, like, like the fucking Jumanji movies or shit like that. Nobody, nobody, the only people that care about Tenacious D and, and anything that they've done are over the age of 40. And the only really relevant comedy right now are females and black guys. And that's the fact. White dudes doing comedy is not relevant right now. At least I, I'm not aware of any. So I hate to give this a one, but I have to because it's fucking boomer as fuck. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, just to uh, just to kind of um, for the devotion to accuracy department. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah Thomas yeah, yeah. Jacob Black, uh, Jack Black is yeah. uh, 1969. So he is firmly ensconced in Generation X at age yeah. 54. And Kyle Gass is a boomer born in 60. He is 63 years old. So a nine year age difference there between yep. them. But I agree totally. This is boomerdom. I mean, and not only is it a boomer for middle aged white guys to sing novelty comedy songs, it's also boomer for middle aged white guys to do rock and roll podcasts where they talk about droopy <laughs> ball sacks. I mean, <laughs> give us a plus one. <laughs> as well for gratuitous boomerism we're right there with them but yeah it's not we're not indicting in any way the activity of the band or the or the productivity of the band or the quality of the band this is science damn it and we have to go with the science and it is for me as well a plus one for gratuitous boomerism yeah, everybody knows how this works. They know that we try to maybe inject our opinions a little bit, but it doesn't interfere with what we're trying to accomplish here. Category two, the metal. metal. Tenacious D, the category is excessive misogyny. And Rico, I have the lyrics available if you'd like to hear them. Yeah, man, I've been looking forward to this all day. All right. You can't kill the metal. The metal will live on. Punk rock tried to kill the metal, but they failed as they were smite to the ground. <laughs> New wave tried to kill the metal, but they failed as they were stricken down to the ground. Grunge tried to kill the metal. They failed as they were thrown to the ground. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No one can destroy the metal. The metal will strike you down with a vicious blow. We are the vanquished foes of the metal. We tried to win for why we do not know. You need any more lyrics? Right? <laughs> well, no, but you didn't do the. You didn't do that part. <laughs> I didn't do that part. No, but you did. Thank you. You completed hey, it. And it, well, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so excessive misogyny. Yeah, this is, gosh, I don't, uh, the only song that he ever, I think, I could be wrong on this, the only song that they ever did about a girl was their first one, and it was not a comedy song. It was actually a serious song about a girl that broke up with him named Melissa, and it they and I think they occasionally do it live, but they quickly changed the, directions because that didn't go over so well from what i understand um but this is not that song and this song clearly there's not even any mention of anything remotely related to that so it's clearly going to be a zero for me uh, oh nice thank you yeah it's a zero dude i mean there's no this is a um it's it's not genderless. It's very much male, but there's no misogyny to be found. So yeah. nothing to discuss here. All right, let's move on. Category three, the metal, the pick of destiny, tenacious D, Jack Black in the gang. Wanton whiteness, Rico. You've touched on it a little bit already, so I think I know where you're going to go. Let's say you. Um, uh, two, two, uh, over 50 year old white dudes check um doing a metal song about metal check um that's comedy check uh there's nothing whiter than that scott um white dudes doing a comedy song that is about metal destroying other genres of music that is going to be a plus one for me yeah it's funny because for a long time and it's amazing how there was an entire era when metal ruled the world, but we were somehow oblivious to the cheese. Not all of us. Some people were calling it out like writers at Rolling Stone or what have you, but fans like myself could not see the gooey cheese right in front of me. So if I heard <laughs> Man o War singing a song, you know, speaking about the dominance of the metal, you know, <laughs> I mean, I took it serious. I was like, yes, oh, yeah. of course. You were like you know, throwing it, up the horns, right? You're like, yeah. that's so metal. Yeah, I was like, I was thinking there's something <laughs> cheesy about this. Them talking about oh, metal will destroy all other genres of music. I, I <laughs> didn't see any cheese at all. So in some respects, I don't know how to take. I mean, I know how to take this song, obviously. I mean, it's. It's kind of like Jack's walking a line where I think he's a true believer like me. He's a legitimate fan, but he's also a self-aware fan who knows how ridiculous the genre is. And so he has a little bit of fun at its expense while also throwing some love its way. So he tries to kind of do both. Do you see it that way? Absolutely. I definitely think he's dipping his toes in both sides uh, and successfully. I mean, really, and, and I, I, this is a good time to bring this up. I mean, I, I don't think I can't think of anybody um, who is a bigger torch carrier for the genre than that guy. I mean, he he and he does it in a user friendly way that gets kids. He's got this whole school of rock thing going on where he's got teenagers playing all this shit that he likes and that we all liked when we were younger and he's perpetuating the genre by being this ginormous torch barrier bearer for for it in a way that kids could, could because he's a giant kid just like me and you in a way that that young people can grab onto he does it in a very user-friendly way and not a cheese way and not a boomer way you know what i mean so yes it, he's very careful and self-aware to your point but at the same time i think he really believes it too are songs like this good for metal where it's kind of obviously point it's poking fun at metal but also kind of propping it up. But ultimately, is it good for metal to kind of be made fun of a little bit and have the piss taken out of it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Be yes, because, well, you, 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 let me ask you, what's, what would be worse for metal? Something like this or the same 50 year old dudes that are trying to seriously play metal and be serious about it and 
people don't go and see them and people don't care about what they're doing because they think they're just a bunch of hang on hanger on or boomers that are just embarrassing themselves what's worse is your back bothering you or are you pushing no i was i was i was sitting up to to try to be more emphatic with my point oh because it looked like you were either like your back was either bothering you or you were pushing out a fart no god dude i've had for probably a month now in uh your rhomboid area which is by your shoulder blades you know in between your spine and your shoulder blades that little strip of muscle i've had on both sides i've had these two knots in the Ooh. same spot on both sides of my spine for probably a month now and and it i have like this cordless massager that i take to work with me and i'm at my desk all hunched over trying to get rid of it and i'm like rubbing up against corners at work and looking like a damn fool because these freaking things are killing me and, and it's been like a whole month now and i can't get them to go away so yeah i've been kind of doing the the maneuvering thing that you saw it's been awful sorry man listen dude wanton whiteness yeah point taken before i uh interrupted you but yes point taken I guess it comes down to any kind of exposure is good exposure, I suppose, for the genre. Wanton whiteness, yeah, it's a big plus one for me. This is this is white ass shit. You know, this is, I mean, it's weird because I never know how to take this stuff. Cause as as a huge kind of like rock nerd, I never know how to take like the novelty songs. And I like them, but I could never like like them as much as i like my stuff you know what i mean yeah and so i mean i had a buddy who was like the biggest weird al yankovic fan ever you know and he went to the concerts and i was like i i can appreciate it i get it but i don't understand how you can be passionate about this like you would be like a real band you know but yeah. to him it was a real band and that was like yeah. the real band he was a fan of weird al but like weird al like uh you know, like um, I'm trying to think of another uh, novelty. Who is the guy who did the radio show that inspired Weird Al that I was oh, uh, totally Jesus. slipping? In the, my mind. There's, there's a couple of guys in the 70s. The guy that did uh, Dr. Demento. Help? Dr. Demento. And there was yeah. the guy that did all those novelty songs. He did like Alley Oop and all that other yep. shit. A Ahab the Arab. Like you could never do that today. But no. Um, but I can't remember that guy's name, but same area. But you get the point. There's always sure. been these people who have operated in the novelty space, and I yeah. just never know how to take them. I get the joke. It's funny. I can always appreciate the talent involved, but I could never latch onto it in like a meaningful way, the same way I would like a band that I'm really into. Right. Well, and so there was always a barrier there for me. Well, here's here's why I think that what Tenacious D does is a, and Jack Black in particular, why what they do and the song is a little bit different because what they're doing is actually inspiring kid young kids to play this stuff. And they're doing it willingly. There's there's school rock shit all like I said, all over the place. And people are latching on to what they're doing and it's inspiring them to listen to this stuff. So it might be a little different than like Weird Al doing parody songs that doesn't necessarily inspire somebody to, to pick up the genre. It just inspires them to listen to more Weird Al. You know what I mean? People are listening to Tenacious D and then they're going and listening to Judas Priest and all that other jazz. You know what I mean? So it's a little bit different in this case, in my opinion. Great point. But Wanton Whiteness white as fuck plus one let's move on category four malignant machismo the metal. metal rico what say you oh this song is totally machismo and in every in a lot of what he does is totally machismo but we have to ask ask ourselves uh would today's today's uh today's what's the word i'm looking for with today's society think that this is a bad look is it malignant um it is mal it is because it's boomer um i can't i'm gonna split this one down the middle and give it a 0.5 that's the best i can do. I, I can't go a full zero on this for obvious reasons because it's punk rock tried to kill the metal i mean that's totally machismo right but is it a full-on bad malignant machismo now so i'm going to split it up and give it a 0.5 
Yeah, I agree, man. I mean, we're pretty much scoring identical tonight. This, I think it's a point five as well. I don't think there's anything here in this song that would be objectionable to modern uh, sensibilities, to modern ears. Right. The subject matter might not be appealing, but Jack Black is. And so I think that that's, you know, he's able to sell this stuff because he's just one of the most likable, popular people in Hollywood. So, you know, so I think it, it can kind of exist in both places. So I would give it a 0.5 as well. It's not, it's, it's certainly not offending anyone. It's macho as hell, but not in a way that's going to get anybody's hackles up. And it's Jack Black. So we actually welcome it from him because we know it's going to make us chuckle. All right, let's move on. Category five, the metal, tenacious D, culture, vulturism. I don't know how to score this. I'm hoping you'll sell me on something. What say you, sir? Um, the kind of things I, I, all right, let's just stick to the song. Um, I, honest, honest to God, I think the, the, the riff in this song is fucking killer dude the riff in this song is absolutely killer in fact there's a lot of metal out there that have entire catalogs that don't have riffs as good as this one um fact okay i think uh, I, I, your your guy dave Grohl, your favorite your favorite rocker dave Grohl, play has played on all of their studio albums He's the one that that cooked up the beat for this song. He's cooked up the beats for all the stuff they've done. I think his 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 drum track and his drum lines are great. I think those are super groovy. Um, and I don't hear anything like them. Any any songs that they've ever done is they're all original, Scott. They don't do covers. So, well, they do covers, and I'll get to that. They do covers as a novelty. But their stuff is all original, and, and nobody does it like they do. So for me, this is going to be a big fat zero. Yeah, it's, you know, shocker. I mean, Dave Grohl was asked to perform some session work for Buddies and showed up and did it. I mean, who who yeah. knew? I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> right. That's kind of like, has he ever turned down any work no, for God, anybody not, ever? Not, not him. <laughs> has he ever said, no, I'm not going to show up to that <laughs> event? No, I'm not going to do that talk show. No, I'm not going to play that tribute concert. No, I'm not going to sit in on drums for your side project. He's never said no he says yes no. to all of it that's um, correct it, to me this one's a little tricky um because like without some degree of vulturism i don't think they could exist i mean i don't yeah, know that because they're just like you know to some degree they're kind of like um especially jack black he's just taking the piss out of the genre you can't really take him seriously. Even if you watch the movie School of Rock and you see him singing, it's a long way to the top. I mean, he's got a schoolboy outfit on and SG, and it looks like satire. It doesn't look yeah. like he's paying tribute. It looks like satire. Always. Yeah. It's only whenever you find out, oh, he really loves this stuff, that you're like, okay, so he's this is coming from the heart. But imagine if it was like when... Um, like, remember the movie Rockstar that was loosely based on Tim Ripper Owens and yeah. Marky Mark played the lead in that? Well, Marky Mark doesn't listen to metal. He's a rapper, right? So when he's playing the lead in a heavy metal movie, it's, it's you know, it's not coming from a, it's, he's, it's literally, he's literally acting, you know, you know, Jack Black, you know, when he's playing the lead in school of rock, if you don't know him and know his history, you might think he's just acting, but he really loves this stuff. I guess what I'm saying is I don't know that any of this, that tenacious D does could exist without some degree of, is it vulturing or is it parody? I mean, is, is what weird Al Yankovic does, even though those are covers with rewritten lyrics are, is that vulturing? I don't know. It's an interesting conversation. They're not taking, songs pre-existing songs they're writing new material but they're doing it in the spirit of i mean this song's called the metal it had to sound like a metal song so they played some of the most metal shit ever you know in a sense i i don't know how to score this i think i'm going to give it a i think i'm going to give it a 0. 0.5 but i don't That's really a good know fair that, score 
I think I'm going to split it down the middle. I think that's how the science is going to play out here. Right. And, and I guess I I have to ask myself, yes, you're, you, and I, I didn't think of that until you started talking about it. I'm like, yes, it makes total sense. Um, he, in order, he, he had to vulture the genre in order to carry the torch for the genre from a certain point of view. It, it makes a, a lot of sense, but, for me, the science of culture vulturism is like I go again. I go back to Led Zeppelin. Like that is they are the like. Um, what's the fucking song we did? Whole lot of love. Yeah, yeah. When we did whole lot and that whole first album is like that is the the definition of culture vulturism uh, from a certain point of view when it's blatant and it's malignant and it's a bad look, right? This is not that. This is more in the spirit of, but I think your point five is totally legit and, and definitely a good way to go. It's interesting because like this is like, didn't this record, it's it's a soundtrack to a movie, right? Yep. And I can remember when this movie came out, and I guess this is an example of how he lifts the genre because Ronnie James Dio is in this movie and he has a song from at the time he had a record out called killing the dragon. And it was a track on there called push, which ended up, I think on this movie, but this movie came out in 2006, yeah. six or eight and six heavy metal was fucking dead, man. It, it, it has, it was killed in the grunge era. It may, and then it became new metal, which people generally hated. And like that 80s stuff, the revival hadn't happened yet. Where like the 80s stuff became, you know, became like desirable again. Yep. The 80s stuff was still viewed as like really, really, really out of style. And in that, guys like Ronnie James Dio, even though he's technically from the late 60s, early 70s, he got lumped into that because of his 80s persona, right? The dragons and the medieval bullshit, right? Yep. So. When Ronnie was put into this, it was almost like it almost like kind of brought him back to the spotlight and gave him some credibility again because his career was on the ropes, man. I mean, it was yeah. like it was not good. I mean, it's watch the Ronnie James Dio documentary. They talk about it. You know, it's like that. That did a number on there's a lot of people who weren't 80s hair bands who got swept up in that purge of hair metal and there was a lot of like peripheral metal that got swept up into that that wasn't the same shit but got kicked to the side just the same yep. and jack black who was a big fan of that stuff said man i gotta i gotta extend an olive branch to my buddy dio here and get him in this movie because i love his music you know yep. and he's been singing dio shit forever and in a way jack black is kind of an no small part in like reviving his career and he's one of the most revered icons in the genre you know yep. so how can you fault what they're doing here you know what yeah. i mean that's i totally agree and uh i have to say this also um when it comes to um jack's vocals what is your i have a very strong opinion about his vocals uh i'll tell you mine if you tell you yours tell me if you if you have any opinion on him, him vocally well i'll tell you what when i when i bought a new car a couple of years ago i had Sirius for free for like three months or something so i listened to a lot of howard stern and yep. they he played a concert that tenacious d did live in studio in its entirety and i was blown away i thought yeah. it was fucking incredible and yep. I think he's a very, very talented vocalist, but I think he, <clears throat> excuse me, I think he lapses into a lot of parody moments where he starts like kind of overacting a little bit. And I think yeah. he's doing it for laughs and doing it to be in character with whatever ridiculous subject matter the song is talking about. But I think there's a really great singer in there, but he just doesn't sing sincerely a lot right there's a couple there's a, you get a couple of glimpses um when i'm listening to the metal on spotify and and the every time it, it's gone from the metal to their cover of wicked game um and and i've heard that before if you listen to gosh if you listen to those two back to back and then listen to him and Jimmy Fallon's cover of More Than Words by Extreme, those are two instances where he's 
singing seriously and trying to put forth a good vocal performance. I, I'm going to, and if somebody wants to fight me on this, I'll do that. But I'm going to give you a pretty strong statement. I feel that Jack Black might be the most versatile vocalist probably in the entire industry right now. Like there's nothing that guy can't do. And he does it really, really well. He is a superbly phenomenal vocalist. And his range is ginormous. Well, you heard it here first, folks. That's it. Rico is laying the hammer down. So fight if you disagree, fight him on it. Let's tally this up, Rico. We're running yeah. out of time here, buddy. Okay. And I'm just so shifty in this chair because my ball sack has gone full deflated balloon on my left thigh and is just Jesus. laying there all sweaty. Yeah, we um, got to end this or else we're going to pop one of those suckers and that's not going to be a good thing. Ooh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I've got decimal points this week. I've got <laughs> what was I doing? Is that metaphorical decimal points or like literal on the page decimal points? <laughs> <laughs> on the page, on the page. All right, I've got three points, Rico. Three points. And I have 2.5, 2.5. 2. 5. 4. 5. For a grand total of 5.5. 5. Science works. Every time. Yeah, I, I, I love what they do. I think all of their stuff is great. Um, I think I, I want them to keep creating original music for as long as they can. I love that he perpetuates the genre that he loves in a way that gets young people to buy into it. That's really hard to do, Scott, to get a genre that only people that are over 50 really care about, that you get people that are like 13 to buy into that. That's really tough to do, and he does it successfully. So um, good on him for that, for sure. Uh, and, and in all seriousness, a moment of rare rock and roll autopsy sincerity here and sugary yeah. sweetness, mm -hmm. if the fans and listeners can hack it, um, <laughs> if I don't make them gag when I get sentimental here. But Jack Black, <laughs> the School of Rock movie has been like a gift to our family. My daughters love that movie. Yep. And at the end, the fade out where they play, it's a long way to the top and they do the extended version over the credits. Yep. I will pick up an acoustic guitar and jam that and my girls will sing it and they'll sing the whole shooby dooby dooby part and the whole thing. <laughs> and they're actually like, they, they take vocal lessons. They they're good singers and it's like, they sound great. And I have so much fun because I'm rocking out like ACDC, a band I love. And my girls are fucking nailing the vocals. It's amazing. That's fucking superb, man. That's amazing. But it's because they love that damn movie. See, it's a win. Good on you, man. Good on Jack Black. Of course, it did live. To, it did lead to the inevitable question of, Dad, what's a groupie? Are they sluts? <laughs> <laughs> um. Hey, listen, man. Answer. Did you, did you answer the question? Hell no. No. <laughs> Um, someday are you going to answer well someday they'll just find out from another <laughs> source and then perhaps one day you guys can talk about it oh uh, man anyway all right gang it's been rock and roll autopsy thank you for listening rico thank you sir and thank you as well all right gang good night now Let me have that special rock and roll music. Yeah! Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. Guys, it was like a mistake. There's no mistake anymore. Oh, Rocking to the dawn, loving to the morning. I'm gone. I'm gone. 
follow us on Twitter at RNR Autopsy, or you can send an email to rock and roll autopsy at gmail.com. And if we run across anything good, we'll mention it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Later. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs>